Good morning and welcome to this Planning and Development Management Committee of Tuesday the 29th of June 2021. Uh, as you can tell, uh, our convener, Councillor McCall, will not be with us today and she has sent her apology, uh, so I will be chairing the, the meeting. Uh, Councillor Hearn is substituting for her on this occasion, so welcome to him. Um, Mr Williams, do we have any other apologies? You're on mute, I'm afraid. Apologies, yes, uh, we have an apology from uh, Councillor McEwen as well. Thank you very much. Uh, as we're on a virtual meeting uh, once again, uh, hopefully not for much longer, but we'll see how it goes. But as a virtual meeting, may I introduce the virtual top table. Uh, I have with me, of course, Mr. Christian Smith, Development Management and Building Standards Service Manager, Mr. Jamie Scott, Team Leader, Mrs. Anne Conliffe, Team Leader, Mr. Sean Panton, Planning Officer, uh, Mr. Jeff Fogg, Legal Services Manager, and Mr. Danny Williams from Committee Services. Members are reminded that if you leave the meeting during consideration of any applications, you are unable to participate uh, or vote on any on that item when you return to the meeting. Unfortunately, this also means that if a member loses their internet connection during consideration of an item, they should not vote on that item. Uh, please advise the clerk via the meeting chat that you are leaving the meeting if you have lost your or if you've lost your connection and are therefore unable to vote on the item. For the proceedings today, can I remind councillors and officers to use the chat box to attract attention? I can't see the, all of the hands going up. I'm unable to have a visual of anybody, obviously, because my screen is limited. I now ask the clerk to go, do a roll call so that we have a, a, a confirmation of attendance for the minute. So, Mr. Williams, if you would do the roll call. Yes, thank you, Councillor Brown, and uh, good morning, everyone. So, um, if I can just, when I call out your name, if you can just let me know uh, whether you're present. So, Councillor Hearn? Present. Councillor Barnacle? Present. Councillor Brown, vote ahead from yourself there. So, Councillor Brock? Present. Councillor Gray? Present. Uh, Councillor Illingworth? Present. Councillor James? Present. Councillor McCall? Oh, sorry, apologies. I've got apologies from Councillor McCall. That's just me going right from my sheet. Uh, Councillor Reid? Present. Uh, Councillor Simpson? Present. Councillor Waters? Present. Councillor Williamson? Present. Present. Thank you. And Councillor Wilson. Present. OK, Councillor Brown, that should be uh, everyone who's meant to be here who is here. Thank you very much. So we'll pass on now to declarations of interest. Are there any declarations of interest this morning? If you have, could you type DI in the chat box for me? And I'll hang on for a second to see if anybody comes through. OK, nothing coming through, so I assume we haven't. Uh, next point, we have two deputations this morning for items 511 and 521. Are we in agreement to hear the deputations? Agrees. 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 Thank you very much. Uh, the next item is the minute of the Planning Man Development Management Committee on 1st of June. Are we all happy to agree the minutes? Agreed. 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 Thank, Agreed. Thank you very much. So we'll move on now Convener, to. Can I comment? Yes. Make a comment about yes. the minutes. Can't yeah. Uh, it's just that uh, Professor Laird was very grateful and appreciative for the feedback he received from Mr. Smith, and he has asked me specifically to pass on his thanks to Mr. Smith. Just want to acknowledge that. Thank you, Mr. Smith. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Thank you. So. We'll move on now to major applications. So we're now moving on to item 511. This is a proposal is for S42 application to modify condition 8, sustainable development, and condition 16, residential occupation, of, of permission 15 backslash 01157 backslash IPM. And I'll ask Mr. Scott to introduce the, the paper. Thank you, Vice Convener. I'll shortly take committee through some stills providing context for the application and an overview of the proposals. Firstly, though, to clarify the intentions of this Section 42 application. 
Planning Permission and Principle was approved under permission 15 slash 01157 IPM for the site known as Almond Valley, which was approved in September 2017 for a mixed use development which included up to 1500 residential units. As part of the Section 42 application, the principle of development is not being considered. Further, no changes to the scale and location of the previously approved development are proposed and the details of physical development for the site are and would be the subject of applications for approval of matter specified in conditions. This application is therefore only seeking changes to existing planning conditions which must be assessed against development plan policy. Firstly, for condition 8, the modification proposed is to change the requirements for carbon reduction through low and zero, technology, low and zero carbon technology, sorry, which would align with current LDP2 standards rather than the requirements of the LDP 2014, which the current condition does. For condition 16, the modification of the previously approved phasing uh, plan and in doing so increasing the level of development that can be permitted in advance of specific road infrastructure improvements being delivered. The existing condition 16 placed the development uh, possible in advance of these travel, sorry, road and travel infrastructure upgrades at a threshold of 90 residential units. A new upper limit of 403 units is now proposed with the phased delivery of the required infrastructure at set stages. I'll now take you through some stills that provide context for the proposal. The still confirms the location of Almond Valley site. It's located to the west of Perth. The application site boundary marked in red replicates that of the extant planning permission and principle. To the east, the site incorporates the new Almond Roundabout, which was formed as part of the Perth Transport Futures Phase 1 project, which now serves the Bertha Park development to the north and Inveralmond Industrial Estate to the east. The current application proposes to take access for the first phases of development from this roundabout. This is a change from the extant approval, where the access was previously being taken from a new roundabout that would be formed off the A85. The site itself incorporates uh, and borders part of Ruthven Field to the east, Hunting Tower to the south and Hunting Tower Field and Almond Bank to the west and north. The majority of the site is in current agricultural use, but it's interspersed with residential and commercial uses. This is the site location plan, this time on an OS base. So this plan just confirms the extent of the site area covering 103 hectares and the boundaries of the application, which reflect the 2017 permission that's in place. I now go through some stills to illustrate the site's planning history for further context. As noted in para one of the report, the Almond Valley site was allocated in LDP 2014, a site H73, for residential development of up to 1500 houses. This still confirms the extent of the allocation, which is visible within the central area. The extent planning permission principle is broadly reflective of this allocation. This next still shows extracts taken from local development plan two. The larger image is of the western expansion area of Perth, just to highlight that this plan is orientated east-west and not north-south. In LDP2, the site allocation carried forward the Almond Valley allocation, a site MU73, which is highlighted by the red box. The area of land to the south across the 85, as noted in the report, now forms part of the Perth West MU70 allocation. The smaller inset image in the upper left is a sketch illustration taken from LDP2 facing northwards. For clarity, this illustration represents the approved planning permission and principle site, not the LDP2 allocation. The purpose of the illustration is to show the vision for the site with its specific requirements such as access points, primary routes and open space protection also shown. The access to the south indicates the A85 roundabout I referred to earlier and to the northeast the access of the now built Almond roundabout is also shown. The approved planning permission and principal site boundary and scale of development have remained consistent and are not subject to review here. The previous slides have however demonstrated that there have been changes to the site's allocations. Just to illustrate this a little further, this still shows the current LDP2 MU73 allocation for Almond Valley in green with the planning permission and principal boundary of that permission in red. The application site doesn't include areas now allocated in Ruthven Field to the east or Almond Bank Lochte to the southwest. Land adjacent to the Almond Bank industrial area is no longer within the allocation, but that area is identified as open space within the indicative master plan. And again, to the south, the land there is now allocated in Perth West. Moving now on to the proposed phasing. This is the indicative phasing plan submitted as part of the extant planning permission in principle. The proposed development phasing was intended to commence from the south east of the site, highlighted at the H5 and H6 zones, and then to continue north and westward in a broadly concentric manner. Moving now to the new phasing proposal. 
This is the proposed phase and plan submitted as part of the current application. It indicates uh, its support for the approach set in the delivery strategy submitted by the applicant, with the proposed phasing to now convince, sorry, commence with phase one in the northeast corner, which is highlighted in the pink and purple, to utilise the new operational Almond Bank, so Almond Roundabout, as referred to earlier. Development would then continue in a broadly east to west manner, and the majority of phase one and all of phase 1A are currently subject of an application for approval of MARS specified in conditions. To the south, to the bottom of the site, the indicative location of the proposed new roundabout and access road from the A85 is visible in grey shading. The phasing plan and delivery strategy ultimately propose for this new junction to, and road to be delivered following phase 1B, which would be no later than the occupation of 403 residential units. And again, the majority of this new vehicle are access and link are subject of a current application for approval of MARS specified in conditions. Both of those applications would require determination after any plan permission and principle granted here. Taking now to the next still, we're now back to the aerial photo. This is just to summarise at this point that the proposed changes to condition 8 would align with the requirements of LDP2 policy 32. The applicant submitted information which demonstrates that the carbon savings would meet the LDP2 required levels. In respect of condition 16, the proposed residential phasing for phases 1, 1A and 1B with the amended delivery of the required new or improved road, active travel and other infrastructure at set thresholds, they are commensurate with specified number of residential units. The transport assessment and other supporting information have demonstrated that these changes can be accommodated, particularly in terms of traffic and road safety, and would remain consistent with LDP2 policies. Overall, the application remains consistent with the extant planning permission in principle and with the development plan, and that concludes the stills convener. Thank you, Mr Scott. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, we have a deputation to hear, and um, hopefully uh, Mr Alistair Wood is on the line. Mr Wood. Mr Wood, can you hear me all right? Good morning, Chair, Councillors. Good, mo Thank good morning. If, uh, good before morning. you start, let me just uh, advise you that you'll have five minutes to make your deputation as normal. Uh, my colleague, Mr Williams, will time it and he will interrupt you at the four minute mark just to warn you that you have one minute left to go. If, if you're happy with that, uh, you can begin your deputation and Mr Williams will start the clock when he hears your voice. If you're happy to proceed. So yeah. it's over to you, Mr Chair, Wood. Chair, Councillors. Thank you for the opportunity to make some brief comments uh, this morning. My name is Alistair Wood. I'm a director of Savills and project team lead on the Almond Valley project. Project team have worked closely with council officers during the determination period for the section 42 application. This application is necessary to reflect the physical delivery of the Western Link Road and Almond Roundabout and to update the position on low and zero carbon technologies since the original Planning permission in principle was granted in 2017. In particular, since then, Western Link Road and Almond Roundabout to the northeast of Almond Valley has been constructed, and indeed, it is already serving as an access to the Bertha Park residential development to the north. The Western Link Roundabout, Almond Roundabout, is significant for Almond Valley because it provides straightforward access into the development site. As a result, it now makes sense. Um, from a site delivery perspective to start constru construction from the northern part of Almond Valley and work southwards as opposed to the previous plan to work from south to north. We consider that this new approach also minimises disruption for the existing community. For example, the majority of construction traffic can enter the site directly from the strategic road network, avoiding the use of local roads completely. The roundabout at the 85 will still be delivered, but at a later date, better reflective of the actual impact on the rules network that the rephased Almond Valley development creates. Detailed roads capacity assessment in relation to the impacts on both the 85 trunk road and local road networks has been undertaken by our highways consultants. As a, result, as a result, it has been proven that a threshold of 403 units is appropriate before the 85 roundabout is required to be constructed. The findings of the capacity assessment report have been agreed with both the Council and Transport Scotland. The Council has set out an amended Condition 16 detailing how road improvements at the Timberwall Crossroads and 85 trunk road should be phased. This starts with road safety improvements in the 80, 85 in the form of active speed reduction signage before develop, any development commences. The applicants are wholly in agreement with the revised condition. 
This application of approval will also amend condition 8 to align with LDP2 on Scottish building standards for low and zero carbon technologies. The applicant team are hopeful that should this Section 42 application be consented, that the consent of the respective approval applications for approval of matter specified in conditions for the primary vehicular route in phase one of the development, namely 340 residential units in the local centre, can be granted later in the summer. This will allow construction of this element of the western growth of Perth to commence, dovetailing with Perth Park and Perth West. We consider this to be an exciting step for the future growth of Perth as outlined within the approved local development plan too. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr Wood. Uh, could I ask you to hold on the line for me in case there are any questions from the committee? Yes. So thank you. So I'll open up now the committee. Do you have any questions for Mr Wood? If you could put them in the chat box for me. We'll just hold on for a second because the chat system can be slow. OK, Mr Wood, it appears there's no questions for you. So thank you very much for your deputation this morning. Thank you for attending uh, and we'll proceed on from there. So thank you very much. Thank you, Chair. Goodbye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. So members we will now open up questions for officers. If you have any questions, could you put uh, the appropriate queue in the box? Uh, Thank you, I'm so, sorry, my chat function is malfunctioning yet again. Oh, OK, um, hold on. Uh, questions, but I'll wait till other colleagues have. OK, uh, OK, I, OK, Councillor Wilson, I've got a note of you. Councillor Waters, you have a question. Uh, thank you. Thank you, convener. I uh, just want to the, the changes with the uh, sustainability and condition eight. Um, given given that we, we have some deadlines set with with social housing in 2032 mm -hmm. and and uh, on the standard of our housing from an environmental sustainable perspective um, with an LDP2, uh, we, we, we see that, it, that there, it's now going to the the, the rec minimum requirement by the Scottish government a, a 10% cut in the carbon the carbon emissions. Uh, how 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 future proof is this? And and I, I understand that as as uh, from a building controls perspective, uh, the site will have to meet the minimum requirements at the time uh, that the the, the applications uh, come forward. But just how how future proof you know are, are we comfortable as a council that that the the the, the uh, standard of housing from a sustainability perspective will last the test of time there won't be any any need in 10 years time to go in and do retrospective work to to bring it up to the standards that we envisage at that time thank you uh, thank you i've got two, two officers answering so i'll ask if i may mr scott first of all to answer Thank you, Mr. Beaver. Thank you for the question, Councillor Waters. So the recommendation of Condition 8 does replicate that that we've attached to numerous other major applications, indeed other sites recently. What that condition requires is two things. So building standards is in and of itself a requirement, so that will be an ever changing requirement. As you say there, there's uh, a set in the applicant support and information. There's going to be a reduction required under new building standards regulations. That's one matter. What the planning condition does is seeking that of that reduction, 10% of the, the amount of the reduction will be delivered through low and zero carbon technologies. And that will move as the application moves forward. We're recommending a direction of 14 years for this application, so it would be a 10% reduction at the current uh, standard. So if that changes in five, 10 years time, it would still be compatible with going forward on the site on an ongoing basis. For the first phases that we currently have under consideration, the applicant has demonstrated that they, they exceed actually the 10% reduction through low and zero carbon technologies. I think instead of the 4.2% that they, they would need to get, they're getting in the order of six. So it meets it now and it will continue to meet it in the future as, a, as a, an advancement from the building standards requirements. And Thank Mr you. Smith, did you want to come in? Yeah, it was just a similar response to that, that the requirement will be at the point of approval. So the building standards continuously change and update reflective of the Scottish Government's requirements. So it's not going to be the case that you would need to retrofit to meet the standard that's set here. The standard will be relevant at the point in time of approval. 
Thank you very much. Just to follow, when, when, uh, thank you, thank you for that answer, uh, Mr. Smith. Um, but just uh, for, for confirmation, when, when you say at the time of approval, would that be the approval of the the full app, the the, the full uh, application rather than in principle application? Well, at this point, we don't have any proposals for housing before us. So the detailed proposals for the housing will require to submit information that sets how how they achieve the ten percent gain on the relevant building standard. <coughs> At the time, at the time of them putting the full application in, rather than principle. So, if, if building from the building control uh, and meeting the, the 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 building house standards, that will be applied at the time they put the full application in. Is that is that right? Yes. Yes, that is correct. Condition eight. Yeah. Sorry. Condition eight says that um, for each application of approval marks specified in condition, they should demonstrate a scheme that contributes at least a 10 percent reduction. So it's at the point of determination for the approval of marks specified in conditions application, and that will go forward on an ongoing basis as, as we've explained. Yeah, okay. so so phase, phase 1A might come in tomorrow and the relevant building standard was that that would be in place at the point of determination. Phase 10 might come in in 5, 6, 7, 14 years and the relevant building standards plus 10 percent would be that which is in place at that point. That's great. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, Councillor Wilson, I'll bring you in now. Vice Convener, thank you very much. Thanks for your forbearance. I think I've managed to find a, a, another method of putting the question in. Um, <clears throat> the um, I have three points to, to raise. If there's other folk waiting in the queue, Vice Convener, I'll defer to them after I've asked my first one. I'm on page five, um, para one. There's various figures given there for the, the, the number of hectares of the overall site. I'm just trying to get my head around the total context of this, bearing in mind this has been going on for 30 years. Um, it quotes their figures of, um, first of all, we deal with the hectares, 98 hectares, um, then the figure of 150 hectares as mentioned, then in the final paragraph, and then 159 hectares, and then uh, finally it says, however, this is an error and the site is and always has been 103 hectares. Now, it can it be all of them? Um, and I wonder if 103 hectares is the total volume land-wise of the site, taking account of the 11 hectares that is now on the south side of the E85 that's, if I can say, hived off to um, Perth West. Um, could we have some clarity on that? Because I just don't understand <laughs> that paragraph terribly well. So if somebody can explain it, um, I'd, I'd, be, I'd be grateful. I, I think Mr Finlayson might be able to answer that one. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Vice Convener. Um, and thank you, Councillor, for the question. It is true that there's a there's a, a range of figures there in that paragraph. Hopefully, what we're trying to do is um, maybe clear things up. The site, first of all, the site is, and it always has been, 103 hectares of up to 1,500 residential units. Um, now, the local development plan site has had a number of um, additions and subtractions over time, um, but the planning permission in principle site boundary and the scale of development are are going to stay consistent. Um, where uh, there have been there have been changes that have come and go over the life of this development. For example, with a new uh, local development plan has been in place. Um, we acknowledge that there have been changes to site boundaries over time, but it is difficult to precise predict ex precisely, and especially when the site has uh, different ranges of capacities coming forward in different phases. So. Without really getting into the the argument about um, uh, what, uh, without really deviating from the, the the question that's in front of us today, um, the site area is consistent with the development that was permitted by the in principle planning permission. The conditions um, are really the subject of review here today, so I'm proposing maybe just to leave it at that, if that's okay. Okay. Uh I think I understand that it's 103. Correct. Full stop. Right. 
Okay. 103 the hectares. The context of this, given the, the length of time, Mr. Finlayson, this has been on the go. I'm on now, Vice Convener, to para 53 on page 13. And it's a similar sort of question because there's um, the number of units, um, residential units, varies from 1,100 in this paragraph to 1,500. Are we talking about 1,500 in total for the in principle? And there's a context to this question that I'll come to in a moment. Um, 1,500 in total number of residential units for the in principle consent. Yeah, I Mr. Scott. Wants to come in. Yeah, Mr. Scott. Thank you, Vice Convener. Yes, Councillor Wilson. So the upper limit on the existing plan of permission in principle is 1,500 units, and this recommendation would carry that forward. Okay. Um, that takes me to part of. Uh, Councillor Wilson, is your last question, or do you have more to go? Yeah, I've, I've, I've just one to go, I think. Um, Fine. Okay. okay. Um, that takes me on to 59, I think, and. Paris 59, um, and that is the, the number, this is condition 16, um, about the Paris 59 and 60, about the number of units that will be allowed as far as in terms of the phasing. And again, we've got a myriad of figures um, here with 340 units. We have um, 403 units. Um, when you add some of them up, the arithmetic to me doesn't quite marry up. Given that that condition 16 is is relevant to the new road structure. And I understand all of that. I am intrigued about that. The simpler bit of this report. Then are we talking about allowing 403 units as a result of this or more? Because that's the bit where we've got 90, we've got 340 and we have um, 403. I just want clarity on the actual number of houses that we'll be approving today. Mr Scott, I think you've come in for that one. Yep, thank you, Councillor Wilson. Hopefully to clarify, on page 29 of the papers, that's the recommended condition 16. You'll see that that condition is broken down into a series of phases or thresholds, if you like. Um, so at the end of the day, the planning permission in principle will still be allowing up to 1500 residential units, but what condition 16 and the changes that are proposed to that condition mean that certain things have to happen at certain points. So for 16A, before any development happens, that's when the enhanced active travel uh, facilities are needed. Condition 16B means that only 90 residential units can be occupied uh, before the operation of the, the local centre. Condition 16C is the 340 units. So that's all of the units that are within phases 1A and 1B that are subject to the current application of approval of March specified condition. They need to be delivered. Uh, sorry, they can be delivered, but at that point, a new vehicular access to the lead is required. Taking a step back slightly, D talks about what's to be required in terms of other active travel routes in and around the site and the A85. Ultimately, the biggest change that's been requested as part of this application is E, which means that no more than 403 residential units within any of the phases listed there can happen until such time as the new uh, roundabout and road off the A85 are delivered. So it's a phasing requirement that this condition is setting out. Beyond that, when phases come forward beyond the 403, they'll be subject to future applications and there may be further phasing requirements, but for the current purposes, it's the phasing of these roads infrastructure up to the point of 403 residential units that condition 16 is concerned with. OK, and that new roundabout was, you showed us on, on a, thanks Mr Scott, and I now understand that more fully. That new roundabout was on a, a, a map that you showed us, which is west of, west of Hunting Tower, is that right? It's to the, if I can ask the stills to go back a couple to the, proposed phasing plan for this application. That's this one. So to the south, you'll see where it says phase 2B in blue. There's a dark grey area. That's the indicative location of the 885 roundabout and then the link road that would serve into the site and effectively act at that point as a through road going all the way through to the Almond roundabout in the northeast. That's the existing roundabout that serves Bertha Park. So that's the indicative, that's the indicative location of where that um, road and roundabout are. 
the road subject of a current application for approval of March specified in condition and the detail of the roundabout would have to come forward. So that's still to be determined, but that is what is needed at the point of 403 dwellings, which would be phase 1A, 1B, 1C. Um, at that point, that's when this new roundabout would be needed. Mr Scott, I'm very grateful for your um, explanation. Vice Convener, thank you for your forbearance and patience. You're welcome. Uh, next question is from Councillor Simpson. Thank you very much indeed, Vice Convener. I, I've shared an office with Councillor Wilson for many years and I'm accustomed to being patient as well. You know, um, I have a, a couple of queries concerning uh, the conclusion to, to Condition 16 starting in page 18. And I just want a little bit of background information to help us with determining what difference this will make today. And I note that, um, that much play is made of, of transport facilities. But um, th that seems to me just to be bus stops and pavements. I'm assuming we have no control over the actual transport itself. So we have no way of knowing whether um, a, a new bus stop or two will make the slightest difference to the frequency or quality of the bus service. So I'm struggling a bit here to understand how that helps us with our determination today. Um, I don't think a bus stop is going to make a huge, a huge difference, I wouldn't have thought. And on the same on the same line, I note right, on page 23, um, they, they're saying uh, that we did make a difference that we did decide now between 90 and 403 dwellings. That's you know, over four and a half times as many. And I'm not seeing there any reason we have to believe that the, that the amount of traffic will, will be that different. Perhaps there's some information here that I've missed uh, or that um, Mr. Salmon or someone else can let us have just to help us determine what difference this is going to make. Vice Convener. Thank you, Councillor. I think Mr. Salmon is going to answer. Good morning, committee. Can you hear me OK? Yeah, we can. Yes, thank you. Uh, on the first point in relation to public transport, uh, there was discussions uh, with our public transport unit and essentially given the current state uh, of being in a pandemic, what they wanted essentially was flexibility. So rather than trying to predict what frequency services and infrastructure that they would be required, uh, there is an ag agreement to be put in place regarding contributions, financial contributions up to half a million pound, which then can be utilised by the public transport unit to ensure that adequate public transport is provided to the site. And they are satisfied with that arrangement. In terms of the changes in proposal from the 90 to the 403 and why that uh, results in a small increase in traffic is to do with utilising the existing infrastructure that has been provided in terms of the Amund roundabout. So with provision of this infrastructure and the changing of the phasing from south to north, in terms of the vehicle distribution, that changes also. So now that you have a very easy direct access to the Amund roundabout, movements in terms of heading north and south on the A9 or in, and heading east onto the A85 are now taken away from the Tivermore, Tivermore crossroads. And essentially, you're exclusively only dealing with westbound movements on the A85 created by 403, rather than all movements created by 90 with a development adjacent to the crossroads. And that's why you have a different distribution, and that's why the impact of the larger number of units is only slightly uh, slightly larger, uh, around 3% during peak periods. Uh, is that satisfactory, Councillor Simpson? Well, if, if I may just be ab ab to be absolutely clear, uh, of the half million pound contribution Mr Salmon refers to there, uh, that may actually result in some actual buses, because I'm concerned sometimes we get lovely shiny new bus stops in pretty much the middle of nowhere and no buses. But I, I just want to be absolutely sure that they're, they're, the public transport unit will be providing some actual transport in, in this. Mr Salmon. The funding to be provided will require to be spent on the site. How that is finally utilised will be dependent on the requirements at the time and decisions that public transport unit will have to take given whatever the current reality is on the ground. Uh, in terms of the sort of public transport plan, which has been put together, a number of options have been looked at to increasing frequency of existing buses. Uh, I believe the number four, uh, as well as potentially 
rerouting several others, as well as providing a brand new service to the site. However, at this time, no definitive decision has been made by the Public Transport Unit. Is that OK, Councillor Simpson? Absolutely fine. Thank you, Vice Mayor. Yeah, thank you. Then uh, I pass on to Councillor James for your question. Thanks, Vice Convener. Um, this is actually in my ward. Uh, and uh, uh, as you'd expect with any large development, it was quite controversial. However, I do know that the um, Community Council and, and a lot of local residents uh, were in favour of uh, starting at the roundabout at uh, Inveralmond um, for development. So I, I welcome that. My concern, though, is uh, on Ruffinfield Road, which runs from the roundabout um, to Ruffinfield School. Uh, and there's some housing there and a very narrow road, which, which is used fairly regular. Um, what impact will it have on or this development have on that road and the residents uh, and the likes of Orchard Garden there, um, I, I wouldn't like to see anybody put out and I wouldn't like to see that road used as a rat run. Um, so it, are there any plans to do anything with that road, please? Mr Salmon again, I think. Indeed, yes. Uh, in terms of rat running, uh, as part of the not the application before us, but in terms of a, a more detailed application to come, there are proposals to put traffic camming uh, along that section to discourage use. Uh, uh, as well as that, as part of the application before us, there is a requirement to provide after 90 units, a active travel link and bridge over the late to link into the new local centre, which in turn links into routes to the existing primary school. So that is essentially to ensure that there is an adequate and safe active travel route uh, to the new local centre and the sort of existing amenities. Thanks for that, Dean. Yeah. Thanks. OK, thank you, Councillor. And uh, Councillor Illingworth, you have a question. Yeah, actually, my, my question has been answered already, so thank you. For that. But can I just very quickly comment that part of phase 2B is uh, also yeah, in... Yeah. Councillor, we'll, we'll come to comments a little bit later if you uh, don't mind. It, it's, uh, a, it's a two second one. OK, fine. Um, it's part of phase 2B is actually in, in my ward, Almdenern, but that, that's the only comment. So thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Um, I'm not seeing any further questions coming through. So members, can I ask uh, if somebody might put a motion forward to move the paper? No one's volunteering, so I'll... Uh, I'll put the motion forward myself then. Um, I'm proposing that we move the paper to approve. Um, this is a reasonably straightforward application, I think, when you read through it. Um, we are looking to modify condition eight, which is, I think, very straightforward. It is just to uh, reflect the changes to um, uh, change to, to the new local development plan to 2019. Condition 16, as has been explained in the paper and explained by officers, is mere of rephasing and it takes into account the new Almond roundabout. Uh, and on that basis, uh, we've been asked to approve the paper. So may I ask, do we have someone to second that, please? Uh, Councillor Reid. Thank you, convener. Uh, happy to second and also happy to beat uh, Councillor James to that seconding. Thank you very much. Um, do we have any amendment? I have no amendment uh, as far as I can see. So I'll open up now to comments. Do we have any comments, please? If we can put C in the box for a comment. There's no comments coming through. So we'll take that as the paper has been approved. Thank you very much, members. Thank you. So we'll now pass on to the next item, which is a local application. Uh, this relates to the siting of a container unit for use as a hot food takeaway and formation of decking for a temporary period. This is to be at the Dunkeld and Burnham railway station in Burnham. Could I ask Mr Panton to introduce the report? Thank you, convener. Can you hear me OK? We can indeed. Perfect. OK, I will now take the committee through the next item on the agenda. As stated, this application is for the siting of a container unit for use as a hot food takeaway 
and the formation of a decking in the car park of Dunkeld and Burnham Railway Station, Burnham. This aerial photo shows the location of the railway station car park in comparison to Dunkeld and Burnham. The site is located immediately to the south of the A9 trunk road, and whilst being located within the Burnham Conservation Area, it is not actually located within the identified settlement of Burn the identified settlement boundary of Burnham as identified in the development plan. The route of the A9 separates the site from the identified settlement of Burnham. This next slide shows the existing and proposed site plans. The proposed site is a small area tucked away from the main area of car parking and away from the principal elevation of the category A listed station building. This area of the car park is currently utilised as an overflow car park. Approximately four overflow spaces will be lost by the granting of this development. The green area on the plan is the proposed container with a wrap around to the west and south of decking and some planters to help screen the area for waste disposal. Moving on to the photographs of the site, this first photograph shows the existing vehicular access into the station car park from the A9. As can be seen from this photograph, there is a deceleration lane for turning traffic from the northbound carriageway and clear visibility on a long straight stretch of road. This photo is taken looking in a northwards direction. It is not proposed to make any changes to this existing junction as part of the application. This next photograph shows Dunkeld and Burnham Station itself, which is a category A listed building. The proposed development is to be located to the opposite end of the car park visible from that in this photograph. You can just see the traffic cones at the far end of the building, which is the location for the container. It is clear from this view of the principal elevation of the listed building that the visual impact of the proposal will be minimal. You will see from this photograph the proposed location of the container and note that it has already been placed on the site. The applicant is aware that this is currently unauthorised and is aware of the risks of placing this on site prior to any planning permission being granted. The applicant has indicated that the reason that this has already been placed on the site is that they do not have anywhere that they can store the container in the interim. The container was not on the site at the time of the submission of the planning application and it remains stored on the site rather than operational. You will also see from this photograph the proximity of the site to the existing cycle network. The blue signs just to the right of the shot indicate the access to the path. This path is the main footpath and cycleway from the station into Dunkeld and Burnham itself and part of the National Cycle Network. The connection to Burnham is via an underpass which goes underneath the A9. It is a very busy route for both cyclists and walkers. At this point, it is worth noting that the target audience for the proposed development is commuting trade at the station and cyclists and walkers of the path network rather than the passing vehicular traffic on the A9. Moving on to the last image for this application, you can see the location of the container in relation to the station building itself. The coned area approximately denotes where the associated decking will adjoin the container on the front and side elevation. As members will note from the associated committee report, the colouring of the container was requested to be amended from yellow to the green colour that we see here today. This requested colour change was considered justified to minimise the visual impact of the proposal upon the setting of the neighbouring listed building. That concludes the stills conveners. I will now leave you with the existing and the proposed site plans again. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Pandon. Uh, as I mentioned again at the beginning, we have a deputation here on this uh, application. Uh, I'm hoping Ms. Schmidt, Ms. Schmidt and Mr. Sevek are on the line. Hopefully they're there. Hopefully you can hear me. Mr. Sevek. Did have a sign splash up saying they had dialed in, but um, and maybe they can't unmute. Can, can somebody speak to them to unmute if we hold on? Is that Mr. Mr. Sevek? Mr. Sevek, if you can unmute. Can yes, I can hear you now. Yes. Ms. Perfect. Schmidt. Good morning. Uh, good morning. Mr. Sevek's there as well, is he? Yes, he's sitting to my right. <laughs> OK, fine. OK, now we're going to have a deputation from you. We allow you five minutes to make your deputation. Uh, my colleague, um, Mr. Williams, will time you and he will interrupt you at the four minute mark to warn you that you have one minute left to speak. Uh, if you're happy with that, 
uh, when we next hear you talk, uh, he will start the clock. So it's over to you. Perfect. Thank you very much. And thank you very much, Mr. Panty, for introducing our concept and um, for the committee to hear ourselves and our business idea today. And I'm sure I will start this way. Everybody's been affected by the pandemic one way or, or another. And for us, it was when the first lockdown hit, my, lo my husband lost his job as a head chef at the Dunkeld House Hotel. And we faced some difficulties going forward from that. Um, but in the middle of the difficulty also lies an opportunity. And it was our dream for a long time to own our own business. And my husband has many great ideas and passion for the resonant business. And that um, this time to that forced us to rest was a good time for us to take that opportunity and put our energy in creating our dream. And after we discussed several um, ideas, we fell in love with the converted shipping container concept, which is ideal for startups or small businesses um, with less investment, um, which we obviously didn't have at the time. And our decision to place it at the Dunkel train station actually came after talking to many locals. My husband, obviously, as I said, worked at the Dunkel um, House Hotel, so he was in touch with many locals. And they all said it would be a great idea. And we have lots of friends that love the outdoors, cycling to, to Dunkel, walking around. It's an absolutely beautiful area. Um, so we decided to make this wee spot um, yeah, something new, something exciting on it. And over the last six months, we've worked really hard to make this dream become a reality. And our concept during that time, you might know, has also changed dramatically and not only the colour. Um, but we couldn't be happier with what we ended up with now. And what we are serving, we're serving freshly prepared burgers and sandwiches that truly reflect um, the Scottish cuisine, cuisine and its quality. And for that, we will be using the local butchers as our main supplier. And we're very, um, it's very important to us that we include the locals in and around Dunkeld um, to not only enjoy our products, but also as suppliers. And um, it is also um, important to us that um, locals can actually afford our products. So, the price will reflect that and everybody will be able to afford our products and take part in this new venture we're going on. Um, Dunkeld is an amazing village for everyone that loves the outdoors and being part of that and promoting the area and the local business over there is would truly mean a lot to us. Um, yeah, that's all I have to say now for the moment. I hope that's a good introduction. If you have any concrete question to our um, idea or venture, um, please feel free. Thank you very much. Fine. Th thank you very much for your deputation. Um, I'm going to open up now. If, you, if you'd like to hold on for a moment, I'll ask if we have any questions from, from our councillors on the committee. So I have one question already flashed out. So Councillor Simpson, you have a question. Thank you very much, Vice Convener, and, and thanks to, to, to Claire Smith for her introduction. I, I, I'm enthused by the idea, but I, I have a couple of concerns. Um, one is, can I ask if any consideration was, was given to installing this facility within the existing extensive buildings that are there already? Yeah, I can answer to that. Um, we are a couple, my husband, as I said, is a head chef. We don't have a lot of startup money and converting that building um, would be a huge, huge investment. Not anybody can, you know, like take lightly. Um, there's a lot to do and obviously it's great A-listed as well. Um, so that would come at a huge expense. It would be an absolute dream for us to do that down the road if the business makes us that rich. Um, but for the moment, the container itself is a way for people that don't have a lot of startup money. The money we have actually came partly from my family back in Germany um, who greatly gave it to me. So it's, it's more a small business, a small in investment that makes a you know that gives a start to our dream that's what we're doing um obviously down the road we would love to convert the, the existing building and then um just one more quick to think one more answer about the existing building and um when we talked with the scott trail at the beginning uh with the scott morrison there was um the, somebody was already interested in the, the building but the the cost of the renovation and uh, the turning, the fixing the entire building was, they, we've been told about a quarter million pounds. 
It's a listed building. It requires a lot of architect, architectural work and um, planning permission. It will take, up, I don't know, it might take years before the planning permission will accept it. And plus, we don't have that much the capital in our hands. It's a quarter million pounds up, up to that range. It will be impossible for us. That's why we started the, with the standard the shipping container the concept. Councillor Simpson, do you have another question? Or are you? Uh, no, I'm quite happy with that. Thank you, Vice Convener. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, Councillor Williamson. Uh, th thank you, Convener. And please, could I just apologise because I have a cockle outside the window. Uh, so if it does start barking, then you'll know where we're coming from. Um, it says on the website uh, that you're open from 7.30 to 9 o'clock in the evening. Uh, but in the papers, it says 11 o'clock in the morning till 10 o'clock at night. Uh, could could you give me some clarity on that, please? Absolutely, because um, the when we put the application, that was a little the confusion between me and then licensee the officer. She tried to help me out, Mr. Mr. Sean, actually. Um, so actually, the the hours that it shows on 11 a.m. to 10 p.m. is actually for alcohol serving lights by law United uh, in Scotland. So down the road, we're going to serve alcohol. Also, we're going to serve the, we're going to apply for an alcohol application. So, but the actual trading hours are 7 a.m. because we will be serving a breakfast, also breakfast items. But by the time it will be 11 a.m., then the by law, we will be eligible to serve beers and Prosecco and et cetera. That's why the, the hours are a little more different. That's all. But well, hours are can be changed, and it the, depends on the season or you know, this is our planning in our head right now, but again, 11 a.m. to 10 p.m. is actual alcohol serving hours in Scotland. Is that okay, Councillor Williamson? You're fine with that? Yes, thank you. Thank you, Convener. Yeah, thank you. Uh, Councillor Gray, you have a question. Uh, thank you, Convener. Um, and thank you, Claire, for uh, Schmidt, for your uh, introduction and pre presentation. Um, Tell me, do you have authority from the real authority to put the, the cabinet there at the moment? I know you don't have it from the planning authority yet, but uh, do you have it from the real authority? Are they content that the, the thing sits there just now? Um, the, the, the Scotch Rail, they have no problem for us to keep in our container over there at this moment. Um, they are OK with that. Uh, we talked with them and we are not operating anyway. But again, the, the just I want to clear one thing very important. The reason we keep the container over there, the company who made the container in Manchester, it's a massive, the very reputable company. So when we start this concept, we had to put ourselves in a queue to make this container. And then by the time container was finished, and we had to bring it over here, and then there was no place that we can put the container. So when we contact with Sean Panton and explain the situation, thankfully, gratefully, he, he said, you know, you can put it on, but if things doesn't go the way it's supposed to be and or if it's with decline or refuse, we have to remove it in certain time. I said, I'm perfectly happy with that, but we cannot keep anywhere else. And then that's why we bring the containers, talk to Scott Trail, they are happy, talk to Sean Panton, they are happy. That's why we are keeping the containers, not operating, surrounded with the lines and everybody's okay with that at this moment. Uh, thank you. The, the other small question, uh, the application for a temporary period, uh, is this to reflect the newness of the operation and perhaps it's uh, and assess thereafter uh, its ability to continue? Well, we, we plan to continue, yes. Um, obviously, the road is getting extended as well, so we had uh, we were in contact with um, Transport Scotland um, um, to review our application at that time when they come to that stretch of the road. Um, obviously, since we're a container, we are easily movable, um, but it's a great spot for us. Obviously, we would we would dream to stay there if possible. And then um, the, the Transport Scotland explanation was actually, they say, you know, it might take years when they don't know when the, this, the extension is going to happen on the A9, but meantime, they are happy. And then they are going, if they will go ahead with the extension of the A9 on the, the dual the motorway, they say that we will contact with you and then we will have a meeting and we will review the entire project. We might remove you, we might not remove you, but it wasn't nothing certain. But at this moment, it was only answer we got from Transport Scotland as 
they didn't object our plan, uh, our project. Thank you very much. I understand. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Uh, um, I have a question, if I may ask. Um, it's regarding um, water. I appreciate there's going to be no plumbing, so I understand that you're you're bringing the water supply with you. Um, so I, I'm just wondering what happens to the wastewater, obviously washing up. Is that do you take that away in a separate container, or is that just allowed to flow into the ground? Um, the the converted shipping containers are designed. Um, there is many many examples all over the world in England, in Wales, in so many other places. So how they design it, there is a there's internal plumbing. So there is a waste water. It's like a it's like a thing about the motor homes. Ah, okay. a waste water container. So mm -hmm. we have a wastewater special container under the sink. Just water goes there. End of the day, end of the night, we just take it away. And then uh, we talk with the recycle center in um in in Perth. And then uh, we are still looking for other waste areas that we, where we can pull the water. But this is water going to be only washing hands and washing the vegetables. So it's not going to destroy the earth or nature or anything else. So, but yeah, we fine. have clean water container, wastewater container in the container. Okay, thank you. And I presume you're going to pick up electricity from the station itself, are you? Yes. Yeah. Okay, fine. Okay, thank you. Um, I haven't seen any other questions come in while we've been talking, so um, I would thank you both for your deputation this morning. Sorry, thank you very much. Um, so, <laughs> Councillor Wilson, you've got problems still, obviously. Uh, Councillor Wilson, we've lost you. Sorry, I didn't mute myself again because I, I, I didn't want to interrupt your flow. Um, <laughs> I did, I did, I did. At ten fifty-five, I put a question in the chat box. Uh, it hasn't come up. At the moment. No, no, I'm sorry, I'm it's not coming up at your end. Um, if I could ask uh, uh, one or two points, um, you mentioned um, that you had permission from ScotRail. Is do ScotRail control the car park or do Network Rail control the car park? Uh, the car park owned by the ScotRail. When we apply for this spot at the first time, the, the first question we ask who controls the car park? And then Scott Morrison, who is in charge for hospitality department for the ScotRail, he said he will make a research. He made a search and then he find out ScotRail actually belongs, the car park belongs to ScotRail. Okay. And you, you, in answer to an earlier question, you did look at the buildings and un understand the cost was was quite e extensive. Have you considered having a, a van type facility here as a temporary measure rather than a a, a container that could be, could be left overnight or taken away overnight? Absolutely, we did consider it, and then uh, we we basically um, we put the both projects side by side, and then our. Uh, the container we tried to do, it was going to be too small for our concept. And then uh, the cost was the, this, the certain containers, the production happens either in Germany or China. And then uh, we made a calculation, we contact with several companies. The, the cost is between container and then shipping container was, the, actually the food caravan was more expensive than shipping containers. And then the, in 2021, now the shipping container becomes a much more favorable. It's like a, a, the recycling, and then it is like a full electric. You, you don't, you cannot, you don't use any gas. So it's like 100% environmental friendly. That's why we choose the container. And then plus, we live in a flat in Perth. We live in Perth. And then even if, say, we had an option that we have a, the motor home that we can pull it together, there was no place we can uh, put it on. So with the shipping container, at least we can put taking around. It will be much more presentable. It will be much more attractive. There is a marketing view. There is a, you know, uh, the advertisement the level. We can promote all over the social media so much easier. It takes much more attention. That's why at the end we choose uh, the converted shipping container design. Thank you. And one final point. I, I, am I right in understanding that the shipping container is fitted out to a degree inside as a, as a a catering unit? Um, well, so the walls are um, made so the EHO, uh, according to EHO regulation, and the kitchen itself, we will be fitting out with kitchen equipment. OK, thank you. Thanks. Thank you, Vice -Vena. Thank you very much. Uh, as I say, I don't think there's any further questions. So, Ms. Ms. Schmidt and Mr. Sevek, thank you very much for your deputation this morning and for answering all the questions. Um, we'll move on from there. So, thank you very much indeed. Thank you very much for giving us. Thank you. Bye bye.
So members will move on now to questions for officers. So I'll open up now for questions for officers. Not seeing anything come through yet. Um, Councillor Wilson, do you have a question just in case yours is not working? Uh, yes and yes. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I think we've, I, one of my questions has already been answered. I think two of them have been. Um, just something on the capacity of the car park. Um, a, it says approximately twice in the report. I never liked the use of the word approximately, but um, and it says overflow car parking. Could we go back to get a bit more detail um, on what the total number of spaces are in the car park and what the if, if this is approximately four, um, let, let's take it as four to five um, spaces, but just what would be the percentage loss of car parking if this if, if this um, facility went ahead? And also we need to bear in mind uh, some people will come here by car if if it if it goes ahead, and that will uh, occupy some of the spaces. Now, my experience at Dunkeld Berman have got on and off trains here, Vice Convener, is is that um, the car park's never overcrowded, but it may be um, that the 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 extra train stopping there recently has increased the the footfall. So, could we get an idea of just the percentage um, take up on 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 the car parking spaces? Thank you. Yeah. Uh, Mr. Penton, I think you want to answer. Yeah, thanks, Councillor Wilson. So the reason it says approximately in the report is there's no actual painted bays at this car park. Um, it's essentially a bit of a free for all. Um, so if cars are parked appropriately, you can get approximately 30 cars in there. But obviously that doesn't account for if people are parked on what would usually be two spaces, etc. Like I say, because there are no painted lines, it makes it difficult to put an exact number on it. Now, the area where this storage container is to go, um, there is space there for approximately three to four cars. So there would be the loss of four spaces approximately there. Um, but that area is an overflow area. So after this development, there would be approximately 30 spaces remaining at the station, um, which would be a loss from 34 spaces currently. Thank you. That's clear. Thank you. Councillor Williamson, you have a question. Uh, thank you, convener. I have several questions. Is that OK? My first question is around about disabled access uh, from the station, from the northbound carriageway. Is there actually any disabled uh, access off the station uh, into this business? And I, I can't see from the plans that are in front of me whether the container will have uh, on its um, decking uh, disabled access to. Um, could officers assist with that? Mr Panton? Yes, yeah, so if you look at the site plan that's before you just now, just where the planters are approximately in front of the bin area, you will see what looks like a triangle pointing towards the decking. And um, that is a ramp up onto the decking. Um, so wheelchair users and those that require assistance of a ramp will be able to access the decked area from the current car park. OK, thank you. It's, it's rather small on my screen, difficult to see. And what about yeah. disabled access to and from trains uh, within the railway station? So Dunkeld station itself um, actually has quite a low platform. Um, it's not um, considered an accessible station on Network Rail's website. Um, however, this proposal is within the car park area, so anyone arriving from either the cycler footpath network or from vehicle will be able to access the development. OK, thank you. Um, my second question is around about advertising. I, I, I read, read in the report that uh, uh, Transport Scotland uh, don't want any advertising at the side of the A9. But I take it there must be some form of we are here advertising um, and what, where would that go if is it is obviously not going to be just an A board. Again, Mr Panton. Yeah, so any requirement for adverts would be subject to a separate application for advertisement consent and we don't have any current application for advertisement consent. So there are no advertisements proposed as part of this current application. 
Um, very, very finally, uh, it's about uh, access back onto the A9, and I know that the junction just slightly down the road from it is a real, real accident spot. Um, are we content with uh, traffic leaving the station or the increased tra traffic leaving the station and heading onto the southbound carriageway? Or, um, the, the, the measures are, you know, this increase will not produce any additional uh, traffic. Sorry, any additional accents? I'll bring Mr. Salmon in on that one. Mr. Salmon? In terms of the existing junction, Transport Scotland have been consulted. Uh, it is their junction uh, and their strategic network. They are content with regards to the impact, both in capacity and road safety terms. Uh, we have also had a look and consulted with PTC's uh, road safety team. They have offered no objection. Um, there is no recorded accident history at that junction uh, in the last five years and as such uh, we are content in regards to the safety of the junction. Councillor Williamson, is that okay for you? Yeah, it's uh, as I say, whilst we're content with the, the looking historically back the, the five years ago, we've had no accidents in the last five years, I would suggest that maybe the the traffic levels are actually quite low, uh, but I would argue possibly with the increased volumes of traffic that uh, are going to be attracted to the to the diner, then that would increase the accident potential, would it not? Through it, through the increased number, uh, it would increase the potential for accidents because of the increased volume. I would I, I ask. I think, I think the aim from Mr. Sevick was it was going to be um, cyclists and, and commuters, but I'll ask Mr. Salmon to answer first. And I think Mr. Smith wants to come in afterwards. In terms of the like the trip generation of of the proposals, they are exceedingly low and um, likely to be single digits within peak hour periods. Uh, so the impact in terms of turning manoeuvres will be very, very limited in the extreme and as such from road safety grounds, there are no reasons for objection on that basis. Okay. Uh, Mr. Smith, would you like to add anything? Yeah, I think it's just clarifying that the, the junction is considered more than adequate. Uh, I think maybe where Councillor Wilson is, uh, Williamson is coming from is driver behaviour. You cannot legislate for that. So unfortunately, the planning system cannot control how people choose to drive. But if they choose to drive in an appropriate manner, the junction is more than adequate and we have no issues from either Transport Scotland or our own uh, council road staff. Thank you very much. Thank um, you. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Inningworth, you had a question. Yeah, uh, I'm, I'm concerned about the lack of toilet facilities with this project. Um, can you talk me through your, your thinking on that? Uh, Mr Penton? Hi, thanks. Yes, so for a um, snack van of this scale, it's it's not a requirement to have toilet facilities as per paragraph 52 on page 51 of the report. Um, the applicants have stated that when they're working there all day, if they do need to make use of the toilet facilities, they can just close the business. Um, there are public toilets available in both Burnham and Dunkeld. The burning up ones are walking distance. Um, you just go onto the cycle path underneath the um, A9 under the underpass and then you're essentially at the Burnham Arts Centre. Um, as for customers, um, because they are targeting commuters, if you like, um, it is hoped that most commuters will have factored into their journey toilet breaks. Um, but like I say, there is no requirement for a development of this scale to have toilet facilities. Um, so we've not insisted upon it as part of the application. Great. OK, thank you for that. Thank you. Councillor Gray, you have a question? Yes, uh, thank you, Gideon. Uh, Mr Panton, just uh, to clarify something in my mind, since I don't know the station very well, but it was remarked that the, the car park at the station is uh, generally lightly used. Would this be reflective of the fact that most of the local population, uh, the safest route for them to access the railway station is via the underpass and therefore cars would not be used generally speaking, towards this station? 
Thanks, Councillor Gray. Yes, where the station is, it is in a sustainable location within Burnham, so anyone who lives within the village centre can walk to the station quite easily, um, and there would be no requirement to take a vehicle. Thank you. That's it. I'm muted. Um, <laughs> I haven't seen any further questions coming through. I'll leave it just for a second if anybody else wants to ask a question. OK, nothing coming through. Further back on my... <laughs> thank you, Councillor Gray, but unfortunately, Councillor James has got in before you. There's an M he put in, I presume, a, a motion. Councillor James. Thanks very much, Vice Convener, and sorry to beat uh, Councillor Gray. Um, it seems we're, we're thinking along the same lines. Um, this is in my council ward. Uh, holy, <laughs> uh, and I noticed it, it, there was 11 objections, but 10 <laughs> uh, representations of support and included in that support was 44 signatures. So, you know, it, it, it's one of those things. Uh, Mr. Servick and, and Ms. Smith are trying to, to open a, a business and, and make a living. And in all honesty, you'd expect a, a a refreshment facility at a train station uh, and God knows how many people have stood on that that platform waiting for a train and would have uh, would have relished a, a cup of tea or something. So I have no problem in uh, and our officers have obviously given plenty of advice, which I thank them for. Uh, and uh, th there's nothing untoward as far as I can see. So I'm more than happy. Uh, to, to propose that we accept the, the report uh, as it stands. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. And I think, Councillor Grow, you want to second it? Yeah, thank you, because we are happy to second. I wouldn't dare tread on Councillor James' toes, he being the local <laughs> councillor. Uh, and I didn't actually notice the motion in because it seemed to be some time previous to my own question. So anyway, it was. Uh, very happy to second this. Uh, it's a good little enterprise and I hope wish it success. Thank you. Thank you, Councillors. Do we have an amendment? Uh, no, I don't think so on this one. Um, so I'll open up to comments if anyone has a comment to make. Um, I will ask Councillor Wilson because I'm not sure if his chat box is working, but. No comment. No comment. OK, fine. Then in the absence of any comments, members, uh, the application is approved. Thank you very much indeed. So we now come to two pans to deal with, um, if we can. Uh, the first one relates to formation of an energy storage facility comprising control building, battery storage, container units, and sewer equipment, boundary treatments, uh, bond, landscaping, and associated works, land south of Newhouse Farm in Perth. And as the report is before you, this is the chance for you to have any comments that you wish to make to officers on this application. So I'll open up for any comments. Councillor Edingworth. Yeah, my, my only comment is that I would ask the planning officers to take into account screening. These uh, containers are, are not particularly attractive, um, so any screening that can be done uh, would be much appreciated. Thank you. Uh, Councillor James. Uh, yeah, uh, second what Councillor Ellingworth said, uh, and also uh, as with all of these facilities, uh, uh, as they've come in, um, I've asked that security and access for um, for, for the fire service is, is given some priority, please. Thank you very much. I'm sure they're noted. Uh, there's no other comments coming through. Oh, sorry, me again. Sorry, sorry Councillor Wilson. <laughs> okay. uh, I'm, I'm sorry to interrupt. Um, it, this application is, in, as you know, in, in Almond and Ern, um, and draw attention to the paragraph three, where it goes from 1.5 hectares to 2.18 hectares. That's nearly, in my book, doubling the size. So it's big. But my purpose in saying that is the areas that are mainly affected, as well as Almond and Ern, communities on the other side of the bypass are Perth North and Perth South. Um, and I think in terms of, and this is a bit of repetition um, of the things that we've already already asked for, um, a vice convener, but I think it's worth emphasising them again. Um, 
I'm on para 19 on page 67. 19A, visual impact and landscape. Given the increase in the size. 19B, scale, design and the layout. Um, and for completion 19C, the relationship to nearby land uses. There's agricultural land immediately there and um, the garden centre and some, some housing fairly close. But there's there's a lot of housing on the other side of the road, and um, I think that's important. Um, F the impacts from construction and operational noise, particularly traffic. This is a landlocked site, vice convener, as you might be familiar with, mm -hmm. and I, I think the late councillor Henry Anderson was particularly keen to make sure that any consideration was given to um, construction traffic. The only way in is over a very narrow bridge with inadequate pedestrian facilities that leads from um, Fittis Drive to old, uh, along Old Gallows Road um, or a section of Old Gallows Road to Noah's Ark. Um, at least the other the other tracks are, are barely passable on a tractor, to be honest, the last time I was around. Um, transport implications, again, servicing um, and how that will work out. Maintenance, this is going to be a big unit. This is part of the, the upgrade process for um, renewable energy, which are welcome. Um, and light and, and noise pollution. I say noise, noise is not particularly mentioned in Para 19, but um, I think the planners need to make sure that they look at any mitigation measures that there would be. Um, the lighting might be security lighting at night, but there will be some and uh, it's bound to affect um, nearby nearby habitations. Um, so I think that these are the things, Vice Convener, um, thanking you for your forbearance that I think are particularly important. And I, I think if I to rank them, I think construction traffic and noise would be the, the highest one. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. I'm sure all the officers will take note of what you've said, uh, and I don't see any other any comments coming through on this one, so we'll pass that one on. Uh, the other pen this morning is 532, uh, which is formation of A9 slip road and junction to B8062 road infrastructure, including landscaping, drainage and associated works at land northeast of Shinnefoot House, Octorada. Um, I have a comment from Lewis, uh, Councillor Simpson. Uh, thank you very much indeed, Vice Convener. Um, it's an area I, I know rather well, having spent some time there the other week trying to find a, it was, it was for me, a hidden planning application site. I did find it eventually. Um, but I just, with all these applications for new pieces of road, I, I hope that the um, council officers will take into account not only the safety of pedestrians and cyclists, but I think also the convenience, because I think sometimes if there has to be a great big long way around for pedestrians and cyclists, um, they, may, they may not take that and take the alternative route. So I hope that both the safety and convenience of other road users other than motorists will be taken into account during this. Thank you, Councillor. Uh, Councillor Reid. Thank you, Convener. Um, there is no doubt that there's total agreement within the communities of Octorard and Abriven that a safe, as alluded to by Councillor Simpson, southbound crossing of the A9 is required as a matter of urgency. At the same time, there is unanimous agreement from the Octorard uh, Community Council, all the hauliers and bus providers, bus operators, that the proposed location is not appropriate. And these bodies have all suggested um, alternatives. It's interesting that in a Fairhurst report, uh, the selection of Shinna Foot as the location for a new A9 junction did not take into consideration the existing lay-by on the A9 or the existing topography, in particular the ground, the volume of ground to be excavated. And it's clear to me, speaking to all the local user groups, that this would be yet another substandard junction coming off the A9 and there's absolutely nobody, and I stress that, nobody in support of this location for the junction. 
everybody wants a junction, uh, a safe junction across the A9, but certainly not at Shinnefoot. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. Councillor Gray. Sorry. Uh, yeah, I, I second what uh, Councillor Reid's saying, but uh, in view of the fact that this is what's here at the moment, we must deal with it. Um, and yes, I would like to see a safe junction. I've got to say, though, that this one here uh, coming out at uh, the junction with the A84, uh, that's a fast piece of road. Am I correct in saying that the traffic coming from the A9 and going to Briven would be coming off here and turning right? as well as the stuff for Octorada turning left. And meanwhile, traffic going from Octorada speeding towards a Briven um, to go to Perth. Um, would it be justified, I feel it would, to have a roundabout at that junction, um, both to slow traffic down on the A84 and to allow safe access to whatever direction traffic's moving from the slip road. Um, that's the one other. The one other comment is that uh, to further what Councillor Reid's saying is the it is strongly felt locally that the transport which will be generated by the uh, employment and uh, commercial site at this, at this end of Octorarda, uh, the traffic from there going south, which inevitably most of it would, um, would require to go up through the town to get there. Therefore, this site, uh, this uh, particular point uh, adds to the reasons for not having uh, this junction at this location. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Gray, and thank you both for your comments. Um, that's precisely why we have these notices that people can um, can make their comment. Um, Councillor Reid, you, you flashed up a question, but it's not really an appropriate time for questions. But what was it you wanted to say? Um, what I'd like to say, and this maybe is a comment, that uh, in the various reports that have associate, been associated with this, there are mentions of closing of the right-hand junctions at Abriven and Dr Ardor, and also uh, creation of a pedestrian crossing to Glen Eagle Station. Um, if these are all part and parcel of the same proposal, should they be put in the application? And similarly, another comment as alluded to by Councillor Gray, um, there are many other locations that can be improved, one at Abriven and the southbound onto the A9 at Octorada. And I just wonder if anybody knows what size of money is in the pot for this Section 75, because um, it would appear that there is a fair amount of money and both of these options could be and should be considered before we have this, what could be ultimately uh, lead to fatalities without any doubt on what is a very substandard road with chicanes and totally inappropriate f location for it to be. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Councillor Reid. I'm not sure if any of the officers want to answer that. Really, it's not the appropriate time for it, but I'll ask if they want to, to come in with an answer. Uh, Mr Smith. Yeah, I think, as was alluded to, this is a um, a proposal of application notice. It's not something that's being promoted by the council. We would be required to assess the merits or otherwise of it, and that would be what we would do. So there would be detailed supporting information that would come alongside any planning application that would assess whether or not there were road safety issues or otherwise. Thank you, Mr. Smith. And Councillor Wilson, you've come up. Um, I'm not sure if there's a question or a comment again. It's really for comments at this stage. Um, thank you, and I'm glad the chat function's working at the receive <laughs> end as well as at the send end on the third or fourth or fifth attempt. Thanks, Vice Convener. Uh, um, comments. Um, as I want to support the local members. This is a complete nonsense. I know the area well. Um, this is a stupid place. Um, I think stupid's the only word for it. However, as Councillor Gray said, uh, this is what is before us. So here's my ideas on what the planning folk can get their teeth into um, to lead them to refusal. Um, well, 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 that's very, that's a prejudicial comment, which I immediately withdraw. But um, I, I think there's serious risks that have been outlined by local members here um, that I think in an inappropriate location. The visual impact for one, um, this is 18, I'm on page 77, um, 18A visual impact and 
18B, the scale design and layout, because we've already had evidence from local members about the constraints of the site and the, the road network. Um, the landscape itself and the amount of earth that needs to be moved and soil. Um, the transport implications of existing patterns of, of local transport um, and what the, the foreseen um, implications would be if there were closures of of the the turns into Achterada and, and the prison. Um, the effects of tourism and economy, I think, are another valid point because if this is to allow ac safe access into the two villages, um, or apparently safe access, uh, then I think the reports need to indicate what the traffic volumes might be and how the, the flaws in that would, would need to be um, examined. Um, I think it's an impact on agriculture as well, because there are, at the moment the, the, the existing road system is used quite a lot by agricultural vehicles. Um, and as we know, vice conveyor, they're very large these days. So I think that that needs to be looked at as well on the grounds both of the impact on the these vehicles, but also the overall impact on additional traffic coming along. And I think Councillor Gray was um, right to draw attention to that. Um, and then uh, as has already been alluded to, 18L, um, the compliance and, accept, and acceptability in association with the se Section 75 uh, uh, agreement. So um, I, I, I stand by my remarks that I think this is the, the, the right thing or possibly the right thing, but in the wrong place. And I just wonder if, if, if we could be writing to Transport Scotland and point that out to them, but we have a, an application before us, so we need to we need to consider it. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. The comments noted. Uh, Councillor Barnacle, you, you've got a queue now. I presume it's a comment for this one. Yes, thanks. Uh, thanks, uh, Vice Convener. Um, I'm just wondering, picking up on the earlier comments from Councillor Wilson and local members that is, is there not some sort of um, dialogue between Transport Scotland and uh, our transport officers before proposals of this nature find the light of day? We, we can see that there's quite a lot of local feeling that this is an inappropriate proposal. So I'm just wondering whether there's any dialogue or consultation that happens before we get to a pan or is is it purely that Transport Scotland decide what they're doing and then consult with the local authority later on? Um, I think really well, obviously it's this time to comment. I understand your question that you're bringing up and Mr Salmon wants to answer so I'll ask him to come in. Uh, yes, I, I will answer in general terms that yes, uh, particularly of development of this scale in nature, uh, there uh, tends to be extensive discussions between ourselves, Transport Scotland and the applicant. That is not to say that the applicant would then proceed to then submit an application which is in line with those discussions. Thank you. Uh, Mr Smith, do you want to come in? Yes, yeah, so maybe just a, a bit of clarification for everybody that you know we don't have an application before us. What this is is a proposal of application notice, which uh, is formulated and submitted to us by the parties that are listed on the screen there, uh, and they are currently undertaking consultation with the local community. Quite clearly, there is uh, some strong opinions in the room in relation to the proposals, and what I would suggest uh, is that those opinions are perhaps relayed to the proponents of the scheme directly uh, as part of that consultation response. Uh, this is the opportunity to make those comments clear and they would require to be responded to in the report that will accompany uh, any uh, future application that sets out how uh, the consultation went and how they responded to that. So it might be worthwhile, as is always the case in relation to these proposal application notices that we bring before you, that if you have strong views uh, or wish to relay the views of your constituents in the local communities, that you relay them to the proponents of the scheme, as well as asking officers to look at the material planning considerations that we set out in the report. Thank you. Thank you, Mr Smith. Uh, I noticed Mr Reid, uh, Councillor Reid, sorry, you want to come back, come back in again? I presume it'd be new comments rather than repeating. 
Uh, yeah, thank you. Thank you. It's just there as a follow up to Councillor Barnacle. Uh, there have been discussions uh, between Perth and Cross uh, officers and um, various other org uh, people involved. And um, it's, it was advised that the conclusion of a report presented, uh, there, there were several constraints which highlighted that the Shinnafoot Junction Improvement Works could not be constructed in accordance with the Section 75 specification and design as shown on the Bear drawing uh, in 2002. And uh, this was agreed by Mr. Dean, uh, Alec Deans, uh, that was Mr. Salmon mentioned that. And both Muir Homes and Stuart Milne Homes have been asked if they could consider an alternative to the construction of the Shinnafoot in places like Abriven and the south the southern aspect of Octorado. Uh, so I'm not sure if there has been any movement by Milne, Milne and Muir. Maybe it's because Milne owns land that uh, might have to be used. I, I'm not sure what the situation is. I'm, I'm not sure. I don't think we need to get into too deeply in this situation, Councillor Reid. It's just really for comments. And as I think Mr Smith has alluded to, it's there's no application at the moment. That will have to be assessed as and when it comes in. But your comments are noted anyway. Um, can I ask if there's anybody else wants to comment? No, then that, gen ladies and gentlemen, that brings us to the end of this morning's meeting, the end of that application and the end of the meeting this morning. Um, we did so without any recess and we haven't even made it to lunch so i'm not sure if that means i'm a success or a failure you'll have to decide that yourselves um could i first of all thank you all for your contributions this morning uh i think both uh, the, the main applications were well questioned and well debated so thank you very much for that uh, thank you to the, the various applicants who made their deputations and of course finally thank you to all the officers uh, who were here this morning and certainly helped me through this morning um thank you all very much and we'll call that a day and close the meeting thank you see you next time thank you.